This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Sean Powers and I talk with Marco Sarich of Plausible.io, which offers an alternative, an open source, free, though it can all cost you if you like, alternative to Google Analytics, which I just found out on this show is actually illegal now in some countries, or maybe it is. That's what we're hearing. And there's, it's a controversial topic, Google Analytics, and not everybody likes it, even though it's widely deployed. And we go very much into depth on what you can do to get around the things people don't like in Google Analytics and the things you would like about your analytics and compliance with GDPR and all the rest of it. It's all coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 675, recorded Wednesday, April 6th, 2022. The Plausible.io alternative to Google Analytics. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by NetFoundry. Make the security of the network entirely irrelevant by isolating your applications and data with open source embedded zero trust. Grab your free swag and free tier now by going to netfoundry.io slash twit. And by Bitwarden, get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by Collide, that's Collide with a K. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit kolide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly, and I am joined this week by the great Sean Powers. And also the mediocre Sean zone. Powers. <laughs> <laughs> you have the whole the whole portfolio there. <laughs> yeah. Me, myself, yeah. and I. <laughs> You're looking good. Oh, well, thank you. You're well thank lit. You. you know, it's 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 not <laughs> snowing anymore in in northern Michigan, so that's a that's a plus. Uh, it's changed it, to rain. So. It's, it's funny living at the other end of an adjacent state uh, right now. I'm in Southern Indiana. Um, I always look at the weather maps and there's always like snow. It's always blue or green where you are. I could I always look at that. Yeah. I'm always looking at your weather more than mine because ours is just rain. We just get rain. We don't get snow here. Yeah. We get rain, rain and then it'll weather. freeze and. Yeah, it, it's, I guess, <laughs> we don't have any other natural, like, disasters. You know, like, there's no tornadoes up here. There's no hurricanes up here. There's no flooding apart from <laughs> my basement up here. Uh, so we get snow. I guess that's our that's our thing, right? We get snow. No, no, nothing since the glacier left 8,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is actually fairly recently. <laughs> they were building pyramids not long after that. So our, our guest today is, uh, is Marco Sarich of Plausible Analytics, who does a... Uh, um, a Google Analytics alternative. You up on that or at all, or have you kept up with this kind of thing? Uh, enough so that I have a lot of questions because, um, I mean, Google an- Analytics is you know kind of ubiquitous; it's everywhere, and that's some of my questions are going to be in regards to that. But I'm also curious. So, why have an alternative is a is a big question of mine. I mean, is there is there an advantage to the end user? Um, is it less creepy? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll wait until Marco can answer, but I have a lot of questions about that because I have a lot of websites, right? Like you'll see my, my yeah. lower third here. I had um, Ant change that just to like my central landing place where it has links to all my different websites. And, and so on all those websites now I'm thinking, okay, analytics are good, right? I mean, juicy, juicy data, but I also care about privacy. I don't want to be creepy. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what, what the alternative, not just there is an alternative, but what that really means to have an alternative. So, yeah, well, we, I don't know if you remember, we at Linux Journal, we dumped Google Analytics because we found that not only were the analytics themselves bad, our readers were blocking it anyway. And this is before we even had the 
GDPR required cookie right, notices right. and stuff like that. And, um, and I don't know what we went with <laughs> at that time. It's gone. Uh, the site's still there, but we're gone. So I don't know what's, what's going on with yeah, that and I, now. I think uh, that the, you know, blocking tracking is pretty much a, a general sort of blacklist. So I'll, I'll, again, more questions, you know, once we get Marco here, uh, does he find that if people block Google Analytics, that their stuff is kind of blocked in the whole mix or, or if there's a, if there's some sort of a differentiation that takes place. And I don't know if he'll even be able to answer those questions, but I think they're good questions to ask. Well, we will find out shortly after I let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Net Foundry. If only there were some ways to stop uh, DDoS attacks, brute force, credential stuffing, CVE or zero day exploits, BGP hijacks, phishing, and more. Well, there is by using OpenZIT, it's open ZITI, to isolate your applications and data, making the security of the network entirely irrelevant. OpenZIT, created and maintained by NetFoundry, represents the next generation of secure open source networking for your applications. It provides everything you need to spin up a truly private zero trust overlay network in minutes across anything directly in your app on any device or in any cloud built on principles of extensibility, flexibility, and scalability. Give your apps superpowers using an OpenZD SDK and a few lines of code or use their tunnelers to spin up zero trust networking in minutes across any cloud or device. Using OpenZD isolates your apps and systems so they cannot be subject to external network level attacks from malicious actors while protecting from internal or even OS networks, such as being immune to network side channel attacks like phishing. No need for expensive and risky reactive patching. Agnostic design patterns ensure you only need commodity internet with outbound ports without needing network engineering skills to implement it. Say goodbye to complex firewall rules, inbound ports, public DNS, static network access controls, and VPNs. Eliminate the tug of war between developers and security. The former can work programmatically with software while the latter have isolated apps driven by policy, visibility, and logs they require. Zero trust is a journey, so start wherever you need based on your priorities. OpenZD offers numerous SDKs tunneling apps for popular OSs, and edge routers in cloud marketplaces. If you don't want to host OpenZD, use the NetFoundry SaaS, including free forever tiers for up to 10 endpoints. OpenZD is trusted by developers at Microsoft, Oracle, and Ramco. Head to netfoundry.io slash twit to learn more and get started. That's netfoundry.io slash twit and get your free swag and free tier now. Okay, so our guest today is Marco Sarich of Plausible Analytics, uh, a, floss, a floss or a FOSS alternative to Google Analytics. Um, he's a co-founder of Plausible, um, which he calls a simple open source, lightweight, less than one kilobyte, um, and privacy-friendly alternative to Google Analytics. Um, this is actually a subject dear to my mind and heart. So welcome, Marco. There he is. Hi, guys. Great. Thanks for having and me you're, on. And you're in Brussels. Just east of Brussels, I Belgium. Um, okay. Getting dark here, uh, half past six <laughs> in the night. And I was hoping, you know, April, the, the weather will be sunny. We'll have some bright outside. I will not need to have this light here in my face. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a very cloudy, rainy day. <laughs> Well, you're looking good and almost everybody uh, is actually listening. <laughs> There's some watching, including our back channel, which I expect to have questions. Um, so for me, how'd you get started? How'd, how'd you get started on, give us the backstory on the the founding of Plausible Analytics. So Plausible Analytics, I am the non-technical co-founder. So I'm, I'm focused on you know, marketing, communication, writing blog posts, social media, things like that. So I was not there. On day one, then my co-founder, who's responsible for design and development, when he started developing the product, that was uh, 2018. Uh, he, he he was able to launch the first version in, in 2019, and, and like uh, 
a year or so into the pro into into the project, because he's a developer, he's not that experienced with marketing and that side of things. He felt there was a need to team up with someone to kind of help uh, drive that side of of, uh, of the project. So so yeah, that's that's how I got involved in in uh, March 2020. So like a year and a half or so after the after the project uh, started being developed. And we were we were at very early stage then, uh, just because there was a, a lack of awareness, a lack of marketing activity. So we we didn't have in like have like one one hundred uh, uh, subscribers at that stage. So so yeah, I, I got involved like that. Um, but then uh, the reason um, we we made this, or the reason we got together to work on it, was that we kind of both had uh, an experience with, with Google, Google analytics. I had it from marketing side of things. So I was the, the marketer that's like, I'm going to use this analytics insights to, you know, do different campaigns and learn about uh, the blog posts that we were writing and things like that. Well, Uku, my co-founder, he had experience from the developer side of things when their, you know, marketing teams and, and people like me would be saying, Oh, can we please install Google analytics on this website and so on. So we kind of had experience. Uh, with Google Analytics from different perspectives, and we kind of felt there was a need, there, there, there was some space for us uh, where we could create a, a little alternative that, that could work for people like us and, 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 and so on. So, so that's how it started. So Sean and I used to be with, um, with, with uh, Linux Journal for a very long time, and we got rid of Google Analytics. I think we got rid of it before Plausible showed up, and we use something else, but we just found our own, our own, like the legitimate side of our own logs showed that Google Analytics was actually quite off on a lot of things. And th there were two other problems. One is most of our, you know, our, our readers who were geeks um, and took things into their own hands in every way they could had actually blocked um, lots and lots of cookies that, that are used by analytics. And and, and on top of that, um, when we looked at it, you know, every visitor is assigned, you know, I think it's a numeric string of some, there's a string of some sort that appears to be anonymous, but there's no confidence. We had no confidence that Google was not using that for its own marketing purposes. So I'm wondering if, if those were, if that's the kind of market you've been talking to, or if I characterized your market a little bit in that description. Uh, it's a part of the market for sure. I think uh, the big change really happened uh, maybe four years ago when GDPR got, um, you know, the, the GDPR legislation in Europe and that got enrolled. Um, that's where the, the whole mindset shifted of many people. The, they were suddenly thinking like things that they were used to do, they, they may not be uh, possible anymore in the future because now suddenly you needed to, you know, get uh, visitor consent in order to place those cookies that Google Analytics is placing on, on visitors' devices and so on. So I think that that, that is really what's driving this, this trend, this really, really growing trend of, of privacy-first alternatives. But definitely like um, uh, in terms of ad blockers and things like that, that that's another trend kind of uh, more on the side from, from the kind of tech uh, audiences. Like I had um, last year, accidentally, I had, uh, we were doing some tests and I had uh, both Google Analytics script and Plausible script on my personal blog at the same time. And somebody shared uh, my blog post about how I switched to Linux from Mac, Mac OS. They, they shared it like on Hacker News, on, on Reddit and so on. It, it got to the home page, to the front page, to the top of Hacker News and, and like the, the R Linux subreddit. And so I was able to, to take that really, really tech heavy traffic and kind of compare these two. And it turned out that I think it was 57%. There's the whole blog post I published with the, the details. Like about 60% of people actually blocked Google Analytics, uh, at least for that really, really tech heavy segment of, you know, Linux interested Hacker News Reddit uh, users. So, so yeah, the, there's definitely that side of things, especially for, you know, the uh, people in tech industry. So, so maybe developer blogs or, or, or you know, services and, and startups that, that are targeting developers and, and other tech heavy uh, users. Because yeah, if you're using Google Analytics to kind of count that, those stats, you will be, you know, you'll be seeing say 50, 60% uh, less than, than actually happens on your site. Now, do you, so this was a blog post. Is this something that you um, hosted where you could compare like, 
I guess, where did you get that percentage from? Was that based on uh, the numbers from Google versus the numbers that your server yeah. told you? And then no, no, how, no. So, how much com compared to the plausible code? I'm curious, you know, yeah. there must be some that's blocked uh, plausible too. So there is a, there's this thing, even, even Google Lens does it these days. There's a server-side tracking. So basically that kind of thing is unblockable. This is something I was, uh, you know, discussing with, right. you know, block list maintainers and things like that. Like the markets, some people are, are saying, okay, there's many people using ad blockers, but we don't want to switch to a privacy first alternative. We just want to use Google Analytics, but we want to count people that use ad blockers. So now there's this server side alternative that Google Analytics introduced. So, so there's actually a way to count even ad blocker users in Google Analytics. But what I did on my blog was have the, the normal um, Google Analytics script. That was one, just the default one. And I had the, the plausible analytics run from my own uh, domain name through a proxy. So I was able to actually see the real number of, of uh, this is um, this is a different post. The, the post I'm discussing right now is on the plausible itself, plausible.io forward slash blog. There, there's one article called, uh, I think 60% of, of Hacker News uh, users are, are blocking Google Analytics. So basically, yeah, I had uh, Google as default, plausible proxy, and I compared the two. Uh, if I if I use the server logs, uh, the, the the difference will be much larger just because server logs don't uh, exclude uh, bots and non-human traffic. Uh, so like uh, there's there's also I did a study on on like difference between uh, um, plausible, which is a JavaScript based uh, analytics and and server log tool. And that was like 17 times more traffic on server logs just because, uh, you know, uh, the, the, those don't exclude uh, uh, bots, crawlers, all the other non-human traffic. So that's kind of less relevant for this conversation. I think uh, we can, uh, that, uh, the, my experience there, at least for that Linux post on Hacker News, uh, showed at least that 60% or so people are using some type of ad blocker of, of actually real human uh, people <laughs> because uh, Plausible is also okay. excluding all the bots like Google Analytics is. Okay, so um, it's clear that at least right now, um, you, you probably get better analytics using your code. Do you think that that is uh, due to a, a lack of um, market saturation, to use some pretty cheesy words, um, where you're not being actively blocked because you're you're not necessarily as highly known as uh, as tracking code, or is is there an inherently less creepy thing that your code does that uh, possibly people aren't actively trying to block? And I, that's kind of a loaded question. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you're going to say, you know, no, our code is much less creepy. But I mean, what what is it about uh, the difference between the two that makes you more attractive to somebody who uh, is is browsing a website where they're like, no, that's fine. You know, I, I'm okay, uh, you know, the JavaScript working from plausible IO. There, there's two parts to this question. Um, one is, first of all, uh, plausible is, is, is new. You know, it started a few years ago after GDPR was introduced. So we, we basically made plausible with GDPR in mind. So there's no cookies. We don't use any cookies. We don't have any type of long-term identifiers. So say I come to a website today and I come back two weeks after, with Plausible, you will not be able to see that it's the same one person. We will be two different visitors. While with Google Analytics, you'll be able to see, okay, this person returned two weeks after. Uh, we don't do any, any cross-site tracking. We don't do any cross-device tracking. So with Google Analytics, again, you, you will be able to know if I have my mobile phone, if I have my laptop, and then you will be able to figure out that this is the same person. None of these things are, are possible with, with uh, Plausible. So that's kind of a quick summary of uh, that, like why we're less creepy. Obviously, we're on the Floss Weekly Show, and we're also in a fully open source project. Um, the other side is the ad blockers. So... so when, when I started a bit plausible, my, my impression was like, okay, we, us and ad blocker maintainers, we're on the same side here. You know, we're trying to remove Google Analytics from as many websites as possible with something open source and, 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 you know, more privacy first. They're trying to do it their way, like by uh, using the ad blockers that they kind of block all the, all the nasty scripts. Uh, so that was my impression. What happened about a um, year, year and a half ago when Plausible suddenly started becoming popular on Hacker News and so on was that we found ourselves in conversations with ad block maintainers who decided to block us too. Uh, 
so there was uh, we had uh, several discussions with um, some of the, the guys. I, mean, I, I use uBlock Origin myself, so uh, I, I was very familiar with that um, uh, with that kind of industry, if you wanted the the, the, the niche. Um, but yes, yeah, so basically the view of many ad block uh, maintainers is that they don't want to, at least those ones that I spoke with, was that they prefer to block everything. The, most of them will just want to block any JavaScript when they, they tell me like that. But basically they prefer to block everything. They, they don't want to decide which analytics tool is, is better than the other, which one is, is more privacy first, which one is less creepy. They don't want to have to kind of have that responsibility. So. So what happens is that they're um, they're blocking everything, at least uh, you know the the easy privacy and block list like that. While uh, you know obviously these days Firefox has a block list, Safari has a block list. Uh, those are not blocking uh, um, tools like Plausible at this stage, but they are blocking Google Analytics. So so there's a there's a bit of a disconnect here, and there's uh, different uh, different people doing different things. Okay. Um, one one last follow up question there. So. Uh, Blocking those is generally, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm just kind of going on assumptions here, but largely on domains, right? I mean, they, they block the Google Analytics domain. Is uh, So your product is open source, but is everything still uh, run from your servers? So, I mean, they, they can be blocked by, by domain, or are there components that are hosted on the local web server that would, uh, I, I, I don't know, open source is an interesting uh, addition because it seems like it would allow you to do more um, flexible hosting of the the JavaScript versus if if all the um, analytics is done uh, locally or could be done locally or is it just the actual uh, code? I guess my real question here that I'm now I'm rambling is uh, what is it that's open source and what is it that um, uh, that plausible does um, that maybe isn't completely um, self hostable kind of thing. Okay, so basically, plausible analytics, the product, the code, is is fully open source. If you're on GitHub, you can you can go view it there. You can see all the development. You can view all the code, inspect it, fork it. Uh, you can we have a um, we have a very easy Docker container. So it, it, we made it very easy for people that want to, people that can, to self-host it on their domain names on their servers. Uh, the other side of things is that we have uh, our cloud version, which again is open source. The same code is running on both the the container and and, and our cloud. It's just there, in, in you know, it's there for people that uh, say don't have the the experience with self-hosting things, or or they they're like, oh, I don't want to deal with uh, self-hosting. I want somebody to to manage it for me. It's kind of easy and convenient. Uh, so we have this um, this service in the cloud, which is. Uh, which is subscription based. Again, we, we don't like uh, we don't use the data we collect. We don't use for any purposes. You know, we, there's no advertising business involved with Plausible and so on. So we don't. There's no kind of like okay, profiling the users, uh, checking out their behavior, and then selling those uh, uh, insights to advertisers. We don't do any of that. So in order to make the the kind of the project uh, sustainable and, and kind of uh, so we can work on it full time. Um, we have this subscription business uh, that's um, that's in the cloud, is inconvenient, and we host everything for you. You just uh, you just look at the stats and, and run your website. You don't have to worry about oh, will I have a huge spike of traffic because I'm on Hacker News, and then do I need to worry about my my uh, you know uh, analytics server being up and running uh, during that high traffic load? So that's the difference. Basically, we have the easy inconvenient in the cloud. We have the self-hosted code. Uh, for those that want to, it's the same really. Uh, both what we do is take that self-hosted code and then run it on a server and kind of manage, manage it for you. Wow. Okay. I, I guess I this is far more open source friendly than I was assuming even going into the show. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so basically, if I decided to self-host all of the analytics, I would not have to worry about having... Um, you know, some over aggressive block list maintainer block, you know, plausible so, stuff because that's generally by domain, correct? That's what people think, but it doesn't work like that. So ad uh, blockers well, in general please. don't yeah. know what's uh, ad blockers in general don't know what's self hosted, what's not. And that, that's something people tell us a lot like, oh, I, I just installed self hosted, but it's blocked. <laughs> so, no, if you, for example, if you use the if you install it on stats.yourdomain.com, that will be blocked. 
if you install it on analytics.yourdomain.com, that will be blocked. If you install it on, I don't know, plausible.yourdomain.com, it will be blocked. If you use plausible.js file name anywhere, it will be blocked. So so the the block lists, there are some are kind of more advanced than others. Some are more like, uh, you know, host files. Some are some kind of know the difference between first party and third party. But in general, uh, some some parts are based on the domain name itself. So everything on, say, plausible.io is blocked as a third party. But some are based on, on the file names and, and things like that, on the folder names. So if you want uh, to run, say, self-hosted plausible on your site, you should try and call it something not related with stats or analytics or plausible. You should, you know, just something irrelevant in order not to be caught by by the ad block maintainers. So what happens then is that in some cases, if they do find it, they will still add you to the list. If they figure out that, okay, this is an analytics script, you'll be manually added to the list. But otherwise, the they kind of general filter won't catch you if you're just using, you know, I don't know, you might call it floss.yourdomain.com. In that case, it probably won't be blocked, at least not immediately. Just avoid wildcard things if, you know, you want to do it. <laughs> I, I guess that makes sense. Um, all right, I, I guess that that makes me think more. But I, I actually appreciate the the openness of the product because um, that's far more open source than I than I thought. I thought it was going to be like a, an open source client that had to report back to your mothership that we were just assuming was um, not creepy. So I, I appreciate that. That's that's incredible. I'm actually will for sure be trying it out because um, I have a lot of sites, and that's uh, I, I have questions about implementation too. But I know that Doc has something else before. <laughs> I I have some the something else that I have is, um, and I have a question definitely following this. But I have to let everybody know that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and is trusted by millions. With Bitwarden, you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault. Bitwarden recently added a new command to the command line interface, serve, that's the command, which will start a local express web server and enable RESTful API calls for interaction with the encrypted vault. Now it's easier than ever to integrate Bitwarden into existing systems and tools we can't wait to see what automations and processes the developer community creates. It's easier than ever to switch over to Bitwarden with improved support for importing from Dashlane, 1Password, and MyKey. Easily import from browsers or other password managers. Last month, Bitwarden started the phased rollout of account switching. Today, it has come to mobile applications. Log in to a total of five Bitwarden accounts to easily switch between without having to log out and log in again. This is perfect for those that use Bitwarden at work and at home. Bitwarden is a must need for your business. It's fully customizable and adapts to your business needs. Use Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether text or files, generate unique and secure passwords for every site with enterprise grade security, that's GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2 compliant. Their end-to-end -end encrypted vault helps mitigate phishing attacks. Their team organization option is $3 a month per user. Share private data securely with coworkers, department, or entire organization. Enterprises can use Bitwarden's enterprise organization plan for just $5 a month per user. Individuals can use their basic free account forever for an unlimited number of passwords or upgrade anytime to their premium account for less than a dollar a month. Their family organization option gives up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. At Twit, we are fans of password managers. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash 
to it. Okay, so so Marco, um, one of the things that you were talking earlier about um, uh, ad blockers and and tracking protection, and these, it occurs to me, it doesn't occur to me, I'd live with this all the time because I use them all and experimentally for the most part, but um, a, a tracking protection such as Privacy Badger provides, for example, um, or uh, Disconnect or some others, they just look at, they're just basically trying to block tracking, but they're also blocking cookies that do tracking. Ad blockers, some of them just block ads, some of them block tracking. It's kind of confusing. I'm wondering to what extent, and then of course the browsers like Safari and Firefox have their own independent block lists or whatever algorithmic approaches they use, which differ again. And now Google has something coming up and there are lots of browsers. Um, one is Avast, I just started using. Another is um, Epic Tor, of course. And those are ways of avoiding the whole thing if you can, but still cookies, some cookies come in. So I'm wondering if you can make better sense than I just did between the distinctions here and how they appear to you. And especially when you have to go off and talk to some of these people, what are they doing? Ad blocking, tracking protection, both, neither, what? Uh, like what I learned uh, speaking to ad blockers, uh, maintainers, the blockless maintainers, is that there is there's no like uh, one rule that applies to them all. It's not like uh, they all got together and they say, okay, let us do this. These are the this is what we aim to block. This is how we decide what to block. This is what we do in this case. This is what we do in that case. There's there's nothing like that. So so you have a. Uh, uh, Many of them are also individuals. So you would have, um, what happened to us recently was that uh, a Mulvad VPN is like an uh, uh, open source VPN that I use myself. Uh, they they started, suddenly started using one block list, uh, which has just one maintainer. It's a person person that basically decides what to put. And, and that then goes to Mulvad and goes to all, all of the users. So basically there's no like a, 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 like a company you can speak to. There's no like organization that, that can kind of communicate to you and say what the whole plan is, uh, why do they block this, why do they block that, why don't they block this. So uh, you have uBlock Origin, which kind of blocks everything, easy privacy. Uh, you have, uh, I think, uh, AdBlock, like the, the original AdBlocker, mm. they, they, they have like different options. So you like, if you install it, by default, it will just block ads. And they will not even block all ads. They will block ads that they think are bad ads, and then they will likely some ads that they think are good, and they don't touch analytics and scripts like that at all. So it really depends on, on what you're using. Like same with Safari. Safari, you know, they, they promote it like, oh, we're blocking Google Analytics, but they're not actually blocking Google Analytics. They're just blocking certain types of cookies that Google Analytics can place and for how long they can they can store it on your device. While you can still you can still count the visitor as normal with Google Analytics even on Safari. So um, so there are there are uh, uh, so many different uh, ways of doing this. So many different people creating their own block lists. So there's really no no like consistency at all in, in my conversations with them. And you know speaking to ten different uh, block list maintainers, you will probably get ten different opinions. Yeah, it, it occurs to me. I mean, I, I have. I juggle lots of these different tools at the same time as at last count, I use, I think eight or nine different browsers. I've been trying out for various purposes in some ways, just to keep different cookie jars. I, I may have multiple accounts of the one company. Like I do photography. I've got four accounts with Flickr and I have them all in different browsers. Um, and I mean, it's hard enough for the user. It's, it's gotta be really hard, not just for the site operator, but for you guys to keep up with this. Cause you could get kind of submarined by one browser comes along and kind of screws up everything you do. I don't know. Are you kind of like hyper vigilant about this or is it just part of the normal operation? Uh, we're pretty relaxed about it. So basically what we, what we, we're very upfront. If you go to, you know, our docs, there's a, a page there about ad blockers and we say it as it is, um, our default script, if you want to use it, uh, use it. That, that is the default, that is the easy one. But know that uh, X percentage of, of uh, you know, visitors, depending on, on your how tech savvy they are, what kind of uh, ad blockers they use, they may block the script and you may have, say, 10%, 20% less, less traffic in your analytics than actually happens on your site. So we say it like that. But then we give, uh, we give people an option. And we say it like that, like, if you do care about ad blockers and if you do want to, to kind of count everyone, 
uh, then you have these options. You know, like Google Analytics offers options for that. Uh, pretty much every other analytics tool offers options for that. So we do too, and and uh, we kind of leave it up to up to the, the site owner to decide. It's it's kind of their their property and, and kind of their wish and their kind of uh, they, they decide on you know do they want to count? Do they care about it at all? Don't they care about you know 10% of people missing from the stats? And we give them options and we make it easy to use if they want to. Uh, there's this proxy option. Uh, there's like an easy Cloudflare worker option that takes like two minutes to set up. Then you run plausible from your own, uh, like a, from your own domain name uh, without needing to self-host, which is kind of a, a much more difficult thing to do. So yeah, we, we're we're pretty much relaxed about it. It's something uh, early on, like last year, when I first encountered this because I did not expect this that you know plausible will be seen as just kind of similar to Google Analytics and it will just be blocked by so many containers. I did not expect this. So early on, it was a bit, uh, it took a while to, to get that point of view. Uh, the, the kind of, there's, the, they don't see the difference between, they're like any tracker, just block everything, any, any JavaScript, any third party kind of. So, but by now, I think uh, we, we found this nice approach of being upfront, telling all, all our users, all our, all our subscribers about how it works and then leaving it up to them and allowing them the options uh, to, to take the, the one that fits best for them. So I, I, I promise that we'll, we'll get off the whole um, blocking thing shortly because I do have other questions. But one, one last uh, thing I want to think about. So the, before the, the ad when we were talking, um, you know, we were talking about like ways to stop from being automatically blocked, you know, with, a, with an ad blocker uh, because, you know, wildcard blocks or, you know, like semi-intelligent domain name blocking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think I, I want to be clear, too, that um, I think my goal and probably most of our, our listeners or viewers goals would uh, be to um, not consequently get blocked by those block lists, but at the same time, you know, I want to respect people's privacy. Um, you said you don't use any cookies. And I know like because of, of laws, a lot of times you go to a website, almost every time you go to any website now, there's a pop-up like, is it okay if, if we give you a cookie? And it, it sounds much more delicious than it actually is. Um, if you don't use cookies, does that mean that you don't have to uh, have warnings like that? And, and either way, is it possible for a person to opt out of tracking or is that something that uh, uh, an end user like myself could facilitate so that, uh, you know, I don't want to automatically get blocked, you know, by anybody who's using a, a, an ad blocker? Because, I mean, I do, too. It's, a, you know, the Internet is no fun with with just ads everywhere. Uh, so I, I guess I want to trick the automated ad blockers, but I don't want to trick my users, if that makes sense. So is there mm -hmm. some sort of a happy medium in there or, or is there a way that we can be transparent about what we're doing Uh with our users and give them the option to not be tracked by us. Yeah, the way the way I look at it is is I, I just I think GDPR is so good. I, I, I maybe you guys are less affected by it because you're in the states and it's not that relevant to you. But in Europe, it's been such a huge change. Like since GDPR came into place, I no longer get all those spam emails and spam calls because people used to sell my email address, sell my phone number. You know, I will sign up for, I don't know, email or whatever, and that will be sold. And that no longer happens, at least not in Europe. Uh, so GDPR has really, really been been great for, for people like me, non-technical uh, users, just, just the normal uh, kind of uh, web users. Because now, at least when, when the website is, is kind of uh, following GDPR according to the rules, they need to put that uh, consent banner up there if they're using cookies or if they're using some type of... Uh, personalized tracking tool or, or some kind of, uh, you know, behavioral tracking for advertising purposes and so on. They need to put that, they need to be, uh, you know, up clear and, and, and honest about it and say, this is what we use. And then the, the important one is that they need to allow you just as easy access to um, refuse as to accept that. Uh, early on in GDPR, uh, you know, even uh, like a few months ago or one year ago, uh, people, you know, like designers or I don't, I don't know who, who's kind of behind this, but uh, they will say, oh, if we allow them easy refuse button, like GDPR demands, 70% of people click on it or 90% of people click on it. Then we cannot see anything. So they, they ended up doing, you know, uh, all these uh, different dark patterns and so on. Like, okay, let's allow them to have accept, but then uh, more info. And then if you click on more info, then you get a long page. And if you scroll a little bit down, then you can get like a reject button. So 
So if, if the GDPR is followed, and an increasing number of sites is following, because there's been several uh, lawsuits around Europe uh, for people using Google Analytics or, or for, for sites not having the nice, uh, nice banners with refuse buttons, if, if when they do follow it, then it's really, really nice, um, nice thing for, for us as, 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 as users of the web, you know. Uh, people that are not necessary in the, in the tech industry, people that don't care about you know the, the, the tech world, they just wanna you know go to Instagram or they wanna uh, read the news or, or, or whatever they wanna do. And for those type of people, uh, this has been such a great change because now you you have you have something that you can trust and, and something that kind of respects your rights and gives you gives you insights into into what's happening behind the scenes that that before you did not know. You would just sign up to a newsletter and and then they. Ten, after, ten days after, you will get a call to that email, to that phone number, to that email address, trying to sell you something, and that no longer happens in Europe. So, from my perspective, GDPR has been great, and and this is the perspective we're taking in Plausible is that we try to follow GDPR. So we we're working with uh, a legal team that that's very following all the all the, the, what GDPR says should be done, what all the different regulations say. We follow them. And, and we work with the legal team to figure out how we can create an, an analytics tool that allows you to track just enough. You cannot track just as much as Google Analytics or other tools do, but you can track just enough so you as a site owner, as a business owner, can get enough information that allows you to, to run your site better, run your business better, uh, you know, improve things and so on uh, without, uh, you know, doing so much that you need to require the, the consent and, and so on. So basically... Basically, that, that's our approach. We really, we've, you know, personally, but also as, as a company, we really, really like what GDPR is doing. And, uh, and it's really been great for, for you know, in general, for, for, for people, for users of the web. And, and obviously, it's created an opportunity for new small startups like Plausible that we can suddenly go in and take, uh, you know, 0.1% or whatever of, of Google's dominance. Uh, of you know, I, I don't know, like millions and millions of websites use Google Analytics, while uh, about forty thousand use Plausible these days. So, so that has created a, an opportunity for us and for other similar products um, uh, to kind of so, create a little bit better, uh, more human-friendly web, if you want. Okay, so it, if so, your your code follows GDPR enough that you don't you aren't forced to do a, a pop up asking for permission to track. Is that? The gist of what I what you're saying is that yeah, basically, um, okay. basically, if you if you if you don't have any uh, long term identifiers, if you don't use uh, like uh, again, this is one thing that people come to Plusbo and they're like, oh, Plusbo is not useful for us because we cannot track, uh, you know, uh, we do a Facebook ad today and that person comes back uh, know, three weeks later and converts. We cannot right. see that that person learned about us on Facebook, and these are the things that you should or you are required to put that consent banner up and ask user for permission. Or can we track you like this so we can learn about your consequence visit and, and so on? But with Plosbo, you cannot. So we don't use cookies. We don't use any kind of local storage, any type of uh, way of figuring out these kind of long-term identifiers, uh, which is uh, good from GDPR aspect, from privacy aspect. But some some people in the you know marketing world and so on, they're, they're like, this is not good enough for what we are used to with Google Analytics. Uh, right. so they want to be of, creepy, uh, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, so, it's, 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 you know, if, if Google Analytics, like, like you said at the start, it's, it's the norm, you know, I don't know, 85, 90% right. of websites use it. Everyone has experience with it. Uh, people, some people, you know, their jobs depend on it. Uh, so going to something that's completely different in that sense, like these kind of long-term identifiers and the ad behavioral kind of retargeting is another big one that's, um, uh, so that kind of stuff is, is difficult to uh, kind of <laughs> give up for some people, but uh, definitely GDPR is kind of slowly, slowly making its way. You know, the, the law is moving slowly, but there's big changes happening in, in Europe on European websites uh, every day. You you see uh, less and less of those um, those kind of fake banners that kind of tell you oh, click more, and then now pretty much every website right. gives you one easy refuse button, and then you you don't have to worry about uh, you know, oh, is my is my data going to be sold to to someone? Uh, you know, further down the line. Okay. Very cool, very cool. So you you did mention that it's that it's everywhere, um, and I, I did. I started the show by talking about just how ubiquitous uh, Google Analytics is, and I, I promise that's the last ten dollar word I'll try to use. But uh, 
it's everywhere, right? I mean, every every application that you download. For example, uh, if you go, like I pointed to my that little uh, SeanPowers.com uh, website, when I install that, it's a it's a little server running a Docker container, and it just has a bunch of links to my various online locations. But as I was, if you go there now, I'm pretty sure Google Analytics has turned on. And the only reason is because while you're setting it up, there's a little spot to paste in your tiny little, like, I don't know how many digit code, right? It starts with like G something, or I don't even know what it starts with, but that's all you have to do to implement it. Everything else is baked in. Um, I'll probably take that out now that I'm thinking about it. It was just the default that I, that was in there. So anyway, uh, but my point is implementing an alternative is more than just deciding to do something else, right? I mean, there, there's, I don't know how easy it is to um, put plausible like in a WordPress site or in like this this uh, application that I'm running, uh, Little Link, I think, or Little, I think that's the name of the application. But um, if it's not baked in, how difficult is it to add that to to various sites? Because I think that's a another big thing is that it's just so baked into everything with Google Analytics that using an alternative is more than just a decision to use an alternative. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, it, before, I would say a few years ago, that was it, it, uh, the situation was much worse. And you know, if you create a CMS, you're just uh, introducing Google Analytics integration. You don't care about any other analytics tool or GDPR at all. But uh, we've really seen over the last two years or so, we've really seen a big shift. And, uh, and, and I mean, Plausible is, is just as easy to install uh, as Google Analytics in most places. Like WordPress, you mentioned, there's a plugin uh, run by us, actually, you just you know activate it and you're done. Um, there's, for example, some CMS tools have, have started coming and telling their audience like, these are the bad sites about Google Analytics. These are some of the alternatives, and this is why you should consider using alternatives. For example, Ghost is uh, one of the kind of um, WordPress alternatives, I guess, uh, for CMS. Like you can run your blog on it, and they're one of them. They're quite big as well, but they're really prominently on their on their site. If you go to like their you know their plugins or their extension version, they have plausible there alongside Google Analytics, and they have in their documentation they they mention why they prefer plausible and why they recommend plausible itself. And there there have been several of these CMS uh, tools that have. Uh, kind of uh, in order to be more GDPR compliant or more useful to, to kind of the, their audience, they have started making kind of easy integration with different tools and not only with Google Analytics. So these days, I think there's only only very, very rarely we hear from a user that says, oh, I'm using this proprietary CMS or whatever, but they only allow me this this little, uh, you know, the UA, UA or whatever it's called, the, the Google Analytics uh, ID that to insert, I cannot insert anything else in the, in the header of my site. But that really happens very rarely, and, and most of the kind of uh, more popular, more open tools out there either have extensions or, or allow you to like just, okay, just paste this little code that we give you, paste it in this and click on save, and then you're running. So I think it's not that difficult these days. I'm wondering, so you, you mentioned Cloudflare earlier and then this ghost thing and their comparison. What are your competitors and how do you stack up or... How do you go in different columns and what are your advantages and disadvantages versus those? Well, basically, the, the way we communicate about it is, is Google Analytics. You know, mm-hmm. 85% of websites uh, run it. Everyone knows it. Everyone has experience with it. Some people love it. Some people hate it. That is our competitor, the main one. So a lot of our communication will be on differences uh, versus Google Analytics. Say, uh, they're more lightweight, so your site runs faster. There's like... They're less than one kilobyte there. Uh, if you run the Google, Inst- the, the default installation that they recommend the, with the Google Tag Manager, it's, it's something like 45 kilobytes, so we're like 45 times lighter, which in these days where you, you want to keep your site fast, it makes a big difference. So we're more lightweight, we're more privacy friendly because of the cookies and all the other things we discussed. Uh, one big one is, is actually most people that come to us, uh, they're not talking about, oh, this is open source or this is... Uh, uh, no cookies or whatever. They're talking about simplicity. So plausible, uh, uh, just by default as well, is like one one report, one page report, and everything you have is there. It's like, I don't know, 10, 15 metrics or whatever you have. It's just there laid out on one page. Takes you probably 10 seconds to scroll up and down if you want and then kind of read, what, uh, learn whatever you need to know about what happened yesterday on your site. While Google Analytics is... Um, 
if you go to that left hand sidebar, there's about 30 different reports and then 30 different sections. Then you can click over subsections and then each has a report. And I think there's a blog post somewhere on our website that I, I kind of went through and calculated, counted them all. And there's like several hundred different metrics and reports that they have while well, we have one. Uh, so for somebody that's, okay, I'm just on Ghost or on WordPress and I'm, I'm going to start my own website. I don't want to learn about uh, which of these 300 reports or metrics I should look at to figure out what happened on my site yesterday. <laughs> I want something simple. So, so that's, um, that's a big one that uh, a lot of people um, kind of, uh, uh, they remark on it to that so the simplicity. These are views kind of, oh, I, I no longer need to hire uh, an expert or two. There's, there's a lot of tools like, uh, oh, we make your Google Instant report easier to use, you know, kind of sign up with us, pay us, and then we connect to your Google Analytics and we kind of extract some of the data and present it in a nicer way. <laughs> so there, there's a whole industry of kind of like making Google Analytics easier to understand while we just... Uh, Plausible itself is built so so people that are not data analysts, people that don't care about analytics, they just want to learn what what happened and how they can improve. They, they can really, you know, get started in five minutes and kind of have a have a sense of, of what's, what's going on. So those are a few of the kind of big differences. The main other competitor in kind of so there's um, Matomo or Opivic. They changed the name a few years ago. I'm not sure what the story behind that was, but they're open source as well. They also allow you, you know, the cloud plus self-hosted. So they will be the closest to us in, in the kind of the floss world, uh, Matomo. Uh, I would say, um, again, we have a little comparison about Matomo versus Plausible. They're, um, you know, they're maybe 15-year-old project by now or 20 or something like that. But basically their, their idea, their philosophy is more to kind of uh, be a replacement, like one for one. Like whatever you can do in, in, in Google Analytics, you should be able to do in Matomo. Kind of, we also have hundreds of reports, hundreds of metrics. You can also do all the cookies and whatever else. Uh, so they're they're kind of thinking of it like that. While we're more like, how do we uh, make analytics better for the GDPR world, for the world of people that don't care about uh, hundreds of reports that just want simple stuff, or for the people that care about speed of their in the loading time and, and so on. So so that's those are the kind of two main competitors that we we kind of look look at and that kind of people, uh, people, uh, pe you know, that we communicate about it and that people can then kind of figure out what plausible stands for because they're kind of, uh, the, the approaches are quite different. One quick question before I go into the, <laughs> to the next ad. Um, what, what are your typical customers or users and, um, and maybe how does it differ? How do they differ from some of these other competitors? And I'm curious about geographical distribution too. You talk about the GDPR world. Well, that's bigger than just Europe. We care about the GDPR in the U.S. as well. I'm not sure about Asia. I've been there a long time. But what? How do how do you how do you see your your customer base? So um, I think geographically, I think about fifty percent of users, just around fifty or maybe forty five, are are U.S. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, tons of people in U.S. care about GDPR because of privacy reasons, because they're targeting also Europeans and so on. Um, otherwise, uh, Germany, France, Spain, uh, Scandinavian countries—they're—they're uh, they're kind of—they're taking the, the rest of the audience. While we, you know, we might have a, a few customers from Asia and, and uh, Australia and so on, but it's not uh, definitely not like uh, uh, you know anywhere near the top. I would say uh, nine out of ten countries in the top ten are European plus USA, something along those lines. Uh, and, and in terms of like what type of sites. Um, early on, it was like two years ago. So when we when we when that first kind of hacker news uh, breakthrough uh, started, being you know developers, uh, personal bloggers, kind of personal blogs, uh, they started being the kind of the early users and kind of adopters of this new new kind of new way of looking at analytics. Uh, over the last uh, year or so, especially like in Europe, uh, over the last few months, we've had quite a quite a big <laughs> big changes like. Uh, uh, in January, Austria came out and said that Google Analytics is illegal. And I think a few weeks after that, so maybe in February or so, France came out and said Google Analytics is illegal as well. And I think uh, the expectation is that several other European countries will come and say the same over the next few months. So uh, in the last few months or six months or one year or whatever, we've seen a, a, an increasing number of, of uh, companies, like uh, real businesses that uh, that are like, Looking at them, that they have data analyst teams, 
like the analytics is something they're paying a team of people to work on. And we've seen uh, companies, uh, large companies like that, uh, adopt uh, uh, plausible as well. So that, that has been really cool that right now we're kind of serving, uh, we're serving anyone who, who wants a good, uh, like privacy first, uh, light to date, simple alternative Google Analytics. We don't really care, you know, are you from USA or Germany or Australia or, or you know, are you uh, one person uh, uh, you know, blog or are you like uh, 1,000 people or or five uh, five team of analyst companies? So we're kind of serving everyone, uh, which which is cool. It, it, it all goes through our self serve. Uh, so there's no like um, some some companies like uh, lock it behind like a, like a, a sales teams and you have to call sales and to deal with enterprise but we just open it up everything is transparent you can see the pricing you can do it yourself uh, sign up and pay so we kind of uh, are, are like open uh, open arms kind of to everyone who, who wants a, a decent alternative to google you know this this thing about i did not know that uh Austria and uh, France had, or had even thought about making Google Analytics illegal. This is a real shifting um, uh, env um, regulatory environment uh, going on underneath everything. And I want to get to that after I let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a new take on endpoint management that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so bad that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their own personal laptops without ever telling anyone. In that scenario, everyone loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state into a dynamic conversation. This conversation starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like the screen lock not being set correctly to hard to solve and nuanced issues like asking people to secure two-factor backup codes sitting in their downloads folder properly. And because it's talking directly to employees, Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using real tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first for teams that slack. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial Today, no credit card required. Visit K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss today. And right now, you can get a goodie bag of Collide swag after signing up for a new trial as their way of saying thank you. So the, the regulatory environment, I mean, there are good reasons not to use Google Analytics anyway. And uh, you've spent some time talking about GDPR compliance. I really like what you've been trying to do with um, with, with A/B testing, how people, how, what kinds of cookie notices work, and and how they may, and trying to make one that doesn't bias people toward just clicking on the big, the big bright green accept one and not noticing the tiny print that says you can customize this in some way. But you know, there's there are new laws. We're just trying to find it. I, the DMA, I think it's called. I forget what that stands for that's come along in Europe that's mostly aimed at the Googles of the world and telling them how not to behave and how to behave. And I'm wondering how much you stay on top of that and how you're looking at that environment changing over the next few months or years. Yeah, so, so what happened in, in Austria and, and, uh, and France earlier this year was that um, Max Schrems, that is like one of the activists in Europe and 
a, a good person to get on the show for sure. Um, uh, he's got the none of your business, Noib. That's like a little, uh, 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 like I guess, nonprofit organization. And what what happens that they um, there was a, a court case a couple of years ago uh, about you know the privacy shield agreement between U, uh, European Union and, and US, where you know Facebook and Google, so the world could take the data of Europeans, transfer it to their headquarters, do whatever they please. Uh, and Max Schrems had this uh, lawsuit that he ended up winning. Uh, which invalidated this agreement. And, and this is what's happening now is like, again, the law is a, a bit, uh, the implementation of the law is a bit delayed, Olive. Uh, so what happened in, in, in January and February is that uh, Max Schrems ended up suing, or, or like, yeah, suing, I think 100, 150 or so websites throughout Europe for using, uh, you know, the, the Facebook um, connect button, the kind of the, the re- remarketing, whatever they're doing with Facebook and Google Analytics. And, and now the first case, uh, first case was ruled in I think January, or February in Austria. Then one was in, in France, and there's cases now coming up in Germany, Denmark, and, and every, every, all the other countries. So like hundred or so different cases, and they're all be looks like you know they all agree together. So the first two ruled this way. That that at least Mark Strams and his team they expect everyone else to rule the same way, basically because Google Analytics is owned by a, a, a American company. And because uh, all their servers are in U.S. owned by an American company, um, that that kind of thing is no, no longer fine according to GDPR. So the, the fact that they're sending uh, the data of Europeans to, to U.S. is no longer okay, um, which is uh, why they why they said that um, you know Google Analytics is illegal. So what will happen now? <laughs> um, that we will have to, you know, I think there's uh, there's talk about it, like there, there's talk about the second privacy shield. Um, like I think there was just a meeting, Biden was in, 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 in Brussels like last week or the week before, and they announced that they kind of agreed on something something new. It, it still has to go through all the all the kind of legal process and through Max Schrems and his team as well uh, to see well, what kind of things they can think, find out. But the, as, as things st- st- stand today, any kind of transfer of, of like, if you're using any kind of uh, American-owned provider and you're like doing, uh, you know, kind of transferring personal data, that cannot be uh, legal according to GDPR. Uh, so basically, what Plausible is doing is that, uh, you know, I'm not the legal expert myself. We have, um, we, we, we work with a legal team that, that kind of, you know, that follows these companies, that's their job, and we, we pay them a uh, retainer to kind of help us with that. And what, what happened, at least with Plausible, is that we we now use uh, exclusively European-owned cloud infrastructure. So not only is it enough to have your servers based in Europe, also the servers must be owned by a European provider. So now, like, um, uh, you know, we, we, we switched uh, to something called Hetzner last year. Uh, that's a... Uh, uh, German-owned, yeah, German-owned uh, cloud provider, like an alternative to all the big ones in, from the US, the, the AWS, the Google, uh, DigitalOcean, and so on. Uh, they're they're European-owned, so our, our now the data we collect is now uh, always stored in Europe, uh, in Germany, and it's it's the servers are owned by a, a European uh, provider, and we do the same for for everything else that we do. Uh, so basically. That's kind of the quick summary of, of what happened there in, in January, February in, in France and Austria and, and why um, at least Max Schrems, the, the guy behind all these lawsuits, is now expecting this to, to basically run through all of Europe, including Germany and, and all the other countries. And, and basically in the next few months, what we've, we've seen a huge increase in, in like demand or, or at least people looking at, kind of asking about plausible over the last three months or so. <laughs> if this continues to happen in like a country one after another, uh, say these kind of things, the same kind of ruling. <laughs> I'm not sure how we will deal with all the kind of uh, demand on us. Uh, we're, we're a small team, uh, like bootstrap team. Uh, oh, right now we're four people. We just hired our fourth person uh, a month ago. So <laughs> we will see how that will work because uh, even at this stage, it's already kind of getting like, wow, it's it's busy. <laughs> so that's fast. I actually... I own and run a server in Austria, so I, I guess this is very pertinent to me. <laughs> Which actually leads me to the the last question that uh, that we have for you, that I have for you anyway. Um, so while Doc was reading the ad and, and 
uh, and you were answering, I was kind of double duty looking at your website as well. It looks like the self-hosting option truly is um, pretty easy to set up. It uses Docker. You actually have very thorough instructions, which I appreciate. Sometimes open source projects kind of uh, uh, try to push people towards their product by obfuscation. You know, oh, dang it, that's another $10 word. Uh, but by making it difficult to implement themselves. And that doesn't look like that's the case at all. So my, my last question for you, rather than just lavishing praise, um, is when I set this up, which I'm going to do this afternoon, um, it, will I actually have the front end too? I mean, will it will it actually be the, the analytics stuff that I'm seeing or am I only going to be installing some back end code and not be able to get all of the all of the awesome sauce? So basically uh, what we've done is it's not a decision that's like a, a business decision because it's it's not a good business decision. We've uh, we made our, our software free, libre, open source, free as in beer. So if you if you care about these things, if you know how to do it, if you if you want to, to spend time on it, there's instructions. There's the, the Docker container. You install it. You can run basically the same as what we can run for you. But obviously, if we run it for you, everything is easier, and you will also need to pay us a fee just because you know, so we can uh, we can continue the development of the pro project and you know run it for you basically. So if you do it yourself, we are not asking for anything. Um, like it's pretty common, like open source, like you mentioned, they either hide the self-hosted version or they kind of uh, okay, you install it, but then suddenly you hit a, a wall that says, oh, now you have to have a license or you need to upgrade and pay for this extra feature. With us, you have the same product as, as you can pay us to host for you. You have the same, you can self-host it yourself. Uh, so there's, a, it's kind of fully open source in that sense. It's AGP licensed. Um, yeah, so basically that that's a kind of, uh, that's a, a decision we've taken is, is uh, to try to be as, as open as possible. And, and, and yeah, that's, that's the way it is. Basically we're kind of counting that by explaining how everything works, our, our like business model is like about subscription fees, and we run it for you. We, we spend the time on uh, developing the project, and then hopefully a certain percentage of people will say, "Okay, that's worth it for me," and I will pay them X amount of money per month to do it for me. We are counting yeah. that that there is enough of that group uh, in order to kind of sustain the the business. And now two of us are full time on the project, and we hire two part time employees, and hopefully later this year we can make them full time as well. And uh, as the project grows because of, of the subscriber fees, hopefully we can continue improving the project, get more people to work full time on open source software and still keep that little option there, the Docker one. If you really do want to, you know, host it in your basement or whatever, you don't want, you don't trust us in any way. Like we do, I, don't, you do, I don't want these guys to handle my server I, at all. You have that option to like go completely do it on your own, and then the only only fees you have to pay for forever are just the fees the fees to to kind of run that server either to a, some different cloud provider or or you know electricity or whatever whatever you have. Yeah. So yeah, completely free. Worth, all the same features. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I'm more likely to pay for a subscription service that offers me the option to self-host, just because I, I truly appreciate that that option. So. Um, I, I hope the business model works for you because that's how you get customers like me. So that said, Doc. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We're going long here. So, and I'm mindful that we actually do turn into pumpkins at a certain point. Um, uh, we, we always close, uh, Barco with, with three questions, which we have time for. <laughs> and, uh, one very, very brief one is, do you have anything to say about blockchain? That's uh, one of our control questions. Blockchain. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, not not much. I'm pretty busy with plausible these days to think about blockchain. But <laughs> interesting, interesting technology. I have a that I, I mean you mean like cryptocurrency as well. I have a I bought some cryptocurrency a few years ago just to kind of follow that uh, that kind of thing. It's it's exciting. But I don't have any kind of direct involvement, so Lucky I guy. don't really have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I often reflect that when I did not buy <laughs> cryptocurrencies. Um, so, okay, so. Um, you said you're not technical, but neither am I. What do you, what do you, would we ask anyway? Um, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Text editor? I'm using, you know what? I'm using Linux. I try to do uh, open source as much as I can. Everything open source is plausible, is everything open source, but I also run everything open source uh, if I can. So I use Linux. I use GNOME, Fedora. Uh, there is a thing, it's called text editor, I can see on my screen. So I, I'm using that. <laughs> 
Uh, the other question, the, the, the scripting language, I don't write code, but a plausible is written in um, Elixir. I think it's called Elixir. My, again, my, my co-founder will be the one to speak to about this. So I guess that's my favorite we, one, we, even we though I will not be able to recognize talk. it. <laughs> yeah. I will not be able to but, recognize what Elixir is or what's the difference between JavaScript, Elixir, and whatever other language, but uh, I guess that's my favorite one. <laughs> This That's is the one. I have the, the brand new. I have the brand new text editor that has replaced Get It. Uh, I have uh, this is the one I have. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> That's Ant for coming up with that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, well, Marco, it has been awesome having you on the show. You've given us a, a lot of very good answers, and uh, I'm glad we went a bit long on this one because it's a lot of stuff there. I have a list of questions here that we still haven't touched on, and we'll have to oh, wow. pick them up at a future point. So, and I encourage everybody to to f follow um, Marco and follow Plausible and see what they're doing. It's exciting stuff. Thank you. It'll be challenging as you keep adding people to your team. That'll be great. Hopefully. Thanks. So, Sean, that was yeah, that was an action-packed show. It was, and I, I, just, I feel like I hugged the. I hugged the camera a little bit or like, no, you didn't I'm sorry, Doc. I was, I was really interested though, because I do host a lot of websites and it's funny because he was talking about, um, uh, trying to figure out data from the Google analytics, you know, interface or whatever. And yeah, I, I, I don't understand the interface there at all. I, I just don't, it, it, I've gotten nothing but like, Oh, look, there's, there's been a visitor to my site and that's as much information as I can glean from that stuff. So I, I truly am. I'm not just saying this cause like, Oh, I'm the co-host on the show, but I'm going to set this up and, and try it out on, you know, at least one or two websites of mine to see what it looks like. I, I'm excited. It's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a, um, uh, I just think there's a, it's, I think it's, it, it's almost right in the middle of, Lots of different sort of controversial things. And I wish I remember better exactly what we went through at Linux Journal in getting rid of Google Analytics. But I remember looking at it um, and there was some stuff in there that kind of creeped me out, you know, like, it, you know, um, visitor number 6598 j or whatever it was, you know, has been here three times and done these things. And I thought, how hard is it to de-anonymize that? And do does Google de-anonymize that? Do you actually... Isn't yeah, like thirty five percent of your things? visitors prefer sleeveless T shirts. Like, what the? Yeah, what the crap? how do you know just, that? <laughs> yeah, I, I it it seemed a little too personal to me, and um, and uh, and Google is too much of a black box about what it does with its data anyway. So that 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 was in my mind as well. Um, and having something like this where you have people who are really trying to help you know what's going on with your website without having to creep people out is just. Awesome. Yeah, That's I came important. into the show expecting to be a grumpy Gus. I, I was expecting to to be the like, well, what makes that better than Google? Why would we want to go with an alternative? Yeah. When, and I I was completely um, not that way at all because uh, yeah, I didn't mention this earlier, but I, I I think I I don't I mean I I ran across Plausible and Marco online somewhere and somehow and I sought him out. I you know he's. He's one of the fish that we caught, <laughs> and uh, and I'm glad we did. It's been a good. It's it's been it's been helpful. Yeah, I wasn't even sure it was open source when we started. I saw that it was like oh, privacy yeah. focused, uh, but yeah, not only is it like is there an open source angle, but that angle is it's all open source. <laughs> so that's yeah. pretty awesome. Well, that's a that's a re that's a threshold here. <laughs> it has to be. It has to be that. Well, it's been great. I'm looking at the clock. This is, I think, the latest we've gone with it without whatever. So um, that's true. I think we're going to be on every, like Windows Weekly if we don't if we don't quit pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'm quickly looking at the at this. I'm trying to find the schedule, which is here, and where is it on the schedule? Next week is somebody. Uh, okay, here we got it. Um, uh, Luis Villa, Villa and Jeremy Katz of Tidelift. So that's coming up next week. And uh, with Aaron as the co-host. So that's going to be a good one. So we'll see you next week, everybody. Did you spend a lot of money on your brand new smartphone? And then you look at the pictures on Facebook and Instagram and you're like, what in the world happened to that photo? Yes, 
You have, I know. It happens to all of us. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands-On Photography, where I'm going to walk you through simple tips and tricks that are going to help make you get the most out of your smartphone camera or your DSLR or mirrorless, whatever you have. And those shots are going to look so much better. I promise you. So make sure you're tuning in to twit.tv slash hop for hands-on photography to find out more.